So welcome to Unit 14, Social Psychology, Module 79, Attraction. These, uh, this recording will align aligns with <laughs> Meyer Psychology for the AP Course 3rd Edition textbook. There are two learning targets for this module, Attraction. Explain why we befriend or fall in love with some people but not others, and describe how romantic love typically, typically changes as time passes. So what are three factors in attraction? Proximity, how near you are to someone, attractiveness, how attractive you find someone, and similarity to yourself. The mere exposure effect is the phenomenon that repeated exposure to novel stimuli increases liking of, an, of something or someone else. For our ancestors, this mere exposure effect likely had survival value. What was familiar was generally safe and approachable. What was unfamiliar was more often dangerous and threatening. Evolution may therefore have hardwired into us the tendency to bond with those who are familiar and to be wary of those whose looks are unfamiliar. So how does familiarity lead to acceptance? So this is an example. When this rare white penguin was born in the Sydney, Australia Zoo, his tuxedoed, peer, his tuxedoed peers, like the typical looking penguins, ostracized him. Zookeepers thought they would need to dye him black to gain acceptance. But after three weeks of contact, the other penguins came to accept him. So does the mere exposure effect apply to ourself? Well, researcher Lisa De Bruin found that humans like other people when their faces incorporate some more features of their own. When McMaster University students played a game with a supposed other player, they were more trusting and cooperative when the other person's image had some of the own, their own facial features morphed into it. So which us is the real us? Because the human face is not perfectly symmetrical, the face we see in the mirror is not the same face our friends see. And most of us, interestingly, prefer the familiar mirror image while our friends like the reverse image. In terms of dating, has online dating increased in the last decade? Yes. Uh, you can see on this visual the percentage of heterosexual and same-sex couples who met online, and there's been an increase um, in the last couple of decades, especially the last decade. So what research has been conducted on the importance of attractiveness? In one study, researchers randomly matched new University of Minnesota students for a welcome week dance. Before the dance, the researchers gave each student a battery of personality and aptitude tests, and they rated each student's physical attractiveness. During the blind date, the couples danced and talked for more than two hours, and then took a brief intermission to rate their dates. So the results, what were they? What predicted whether they liked each other? Only one thing, and it was appearance. Both men and women liked the good looking dates best. But what is considered attractive? Conceptions of attractiveness vary by culture and over time. Yet some adult physical features, such as a healthy appearance and a relatively symmetrical face seem attractive everywhere. So which of these faces offered by the University of St. Andrews psychologist David Perrette is most attractive? Most people say it's the face on the right, which is actually a non-existent person that is the average composite of these three faces plus 57 other actual faces. What makes a face attractive? Well, facial features that are neither unusually large or small and symmetrical faces and bodies are perceived as more sexually attractive. How about, how do our feelings influence our perceptions of attractiveness? Given two people, one that is honest, humorous, and polite, and the other that is rude, unfair, and abusive, most people perceive the person with the appealing traits as more physically attractive. As we see our loved ones again and again, their physical imperfections grow less noticeable and their attractiveness becomes more apparent. So how about opposites attract? Is that true? Well, compared with randomly paired people, friends and couples are far more likely to share common attitudes, beliefs, and interests. And for that matter, even age, religion, race, education, intelligence, smoking behavior, and economic status. Moreover, the more alike people are, the more their liking endures over time. So in real life, opposites don't attract, they retract. Similarity attracts, perceived dissimilarity does not attract. How does being liked and respected ourselves impact attractiveness of others? When we believe someone likes us, we feel good and respond to them warmly. 
which leads them to like us even more. Sort of a reciprocal relationship there. We will like those whose behavior is rewarding to us, including those who are both able and willing to help us achieve our goals. So in terms of love over time, how does that change? Well, sometimes people move quickly from initial impressions to friendship to the more intense complex in that mysterious state of romantic love. If love endures, temporary passionate love kind of mellows into a lingering companion, companion sort of love. Passionate love is an aroused state of intense positive absorption in another, usually present at the beginning of a romantic relationship. Passionate love mixes something new with something positive. We intensely desire to be with our partner when we are in passionate love. So passion is seeing our partner simulates blood flow to a brain region linked to craving and obsession. What is the Schachter Singer two-factor theory of emotion? If you've been following along in earlier modules, you'll have heard of this before. It is our physical reactions and our thoughts. So our perceptions, memories, and interpretations together create emotion. Um, in this two-factor theory, emotions have two ingredients, physical arousal and cognitive appraisal. An emotional experience, Schachter and Singer argued, requires a conscious interpretation of that arousal. So what research has been conducted on the two-factor theory and attraction? In one experiment, researchers studied people crossing two bridges above British Columbia's Rocky Capilano River. One, a swaying footbridge, was 230 feet above the rocks. The other was low and solid. As men came off each bridge, an attractive young female researcher intercepted them and asked them to fill out a short questionnaire. She then offered her phone number in case they wanted to hear more about her project. So the results of this study, um, here's what happened. Far more of the men who had just crossed the high bridge, which left their hearts pounding, accepted the number and later called the woman. The physical arousal, the heart pounding, plus the cognitive appraisal, I must find her attractive, equals attractiveness. To be revved up and to associate some of that arousal with a desirable person is to feel the pull of passion. Companionate love is the deep affection affectionate attachment we feel for those with whom our lives are intertwined. As love matures, it typically becomes a steadier companionate love, a deep affectionate attachment. In the most satisfying marriages, attraction and sexual desire endure, minus the obsession of early stage romance. What chemicals are involved in love? During the passionate love phase, passion facilitating hormones and neurotransmitters such as testosterone, dopamine, and adrenaline flood the body and produce intense physiological changes. As passionate love transitions, transitions to companionate love, the release of oxytocin supports feelings of trust, calmness, and bond bonding with the mate. So in talking about relationships, we're going to be switching into that a little bit. What is equity? Equity is a condition in which people receive from a relationship in proportion to what they give to it. When equity exists, the chances for sustained and satisfying companionate love have been good. In one national survey, sharing household chores ranked third after faithfulness and a happy sexual relationship on a list of nine things people associated with successful marriages. Self-disclosure is the act of revealing intimate aspects of ourselves to others. Sharing includes self-disclosure, revealing likes, dislikes, dreams, and worries in both proud and shameful moments. Self-disclosure breeds liking, and liking breeds self-disclosure. So again, again, another reciprocal sort of situation. This uh, enduring love. So this is an image on the right that's pretty powerful. This 5,000 to 6,000 year old Romeo and Juliet, young couple, as they're called, was unearthed, locked and embraced near Rome. So in relationships, how important is positive support? Well, relationship, co relationship conflicts are inevitable, but hurtful communications are not. For unhappy couples, disagreements, criticisms, and put downs are routine. For happy couples and enduring relationships, positive interactions, things like compliments, touches, laughing, outnumber negative interactions, sarcasm, disapproval, and insults by at least five to one. So back to the learning targets. Proximity, which is geographical nearness, increases liking, in part because of what we know about the mere exposure effect. Exposure to novel stimuli increases liking of those stimuli. Physical attractiveness increases social opportunities and improves the way we are perceived. 
Similarity of attitudes and interests greatly increases liking, especially as relationships develop. We also like those who like us. So intimate love relationships start with passionate love, an intensely aroused state. Over time, the strong affection of a companionate love may develop, especially if enhanced by an equitable relationship, by intimate self-disclosure, and by positive support. That is the end of this module. Thank you for listening. Take care.